Well, good evening. It's good to see every one of you. Yes, a great day, right? A little bit of a drizzle, but it's okay, right? We can uh, deal with the drizzle and uh, thank God for that, right? Yes, I'm so grateful to see each and every one of you and I thank God that uh, we are here to learn something good and I believe tonight we will be finishing the book of Joshua. That is my goal, to finish it all tonight so that uh, we'll be able to begin the next one, which is the book of Judges. It's interesting, the book of Joshua is the book of victory, but then the book of Judges is the book of failures. And you'll be able to see why, because uh, God's ultimate goal is for man not to be dependent on man. God's ultimate goal is for man to be dependent on him. And so you'll find out that after Joshua's death, there is no one who is appointed. You'll realize from Abraham, there's always someone who is appointed, appointed, appointed. But when Joshua is coming over here, there is nobody appointed to be able to pick up after Joshua. And you wonder why. Why isn't there somebody else picking up? Because you've already been given what you need to know, so now you need to trust God and walk with that. But then they failed because as long as there is nobody who is there to lead me, then I'm going to do whatever I think is right in my eyes. That is not right because you've been taught on what you need to do. And likewise today also, there are people, if they don't have somebody in their life, they can never really walk their Christian life because somebody is not there. But God wants you to be able to trust him. Yes, man will be there to show you what to do, but not to be the one whom you need to look unto to know what to do. And that's why the book of Judges is called a book of failure. And we'll see all the failures that they've had and how God was so merciful and brought in so many people in to help them so that they can fulfill what they ought to fulfill. Amen? All right, let's open the word of prayer, beginning chapter 14, where we left last week. Father, we glorify your name this evening. We are so grateful for your loving kindness and your mercy. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the enlightener of our eyes. We thank you that you help us see the hidden things that are in the Word of God. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher, our instructor, our comforter, our guide. And this evening, we are so grateful for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, that through the blood of Jesus, we can say, God, you are our Father. And we thank you for the anointing that destroys every yoke and removes every burden. And Lord, we give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so we went through chapter 13 last week, and we realized that chapter 13 through chapter 22 is about the division of the land, how the land is being allocated for every tribe. And so in chapter 13, uh, we see that the land that uh, God had promised Abraham, and then Isaac and Jacob and Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, leading them into, now they begin to divide this land. Chapter 1 through chapter 12, they are actually fight, fighting to drive out all the inhabitants of the land so that they can conquer it. And so we find that that is there in chapter 13. Joshua is still telling them there's still a lot of territory that we have not uh, occupied yet. And so there are still some people we need to drive out. And so in chapter 14, they are still into the division of the land, but now we have somebody else who shows up, and this is Caleb. We know Caleb from the book of Numbers, and we do not hear about him again until now we come to the book of Joshua chapter 14. And I want to uh, draw your attention in verses 6 through verses 12. Verses 6 through verses 12 of Joshua chapter 14, and it says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh, Barnea. So here Joshua is now, no, Caleb is now reminding Joshua. Do you remember what Moses spoke to us? How long ago? 45 years ago. He never let it go. Today, we let things go so easy. You hear God speak to you today, within two weeks you've forgotten what it was. But here he is, 45 years later, he's telling Joshua that, do you remember? You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea? What was that word? Well, that word was in Numbers chapter 14, verses 24 and verses 30. And this is what he says, but my servant Caleb was different. He follows me completely, so I will bring him into the land that he has already seen, and his people will get that land. 
So none of you will ever enter and live in the land that I promised to give you. Only Caleb, son of Jephne, and Joshua, son of Nun, will enter the land. That is what Moses spoke in Numbers chapter 14, 45 years ago. And he remembers. That is what was spoken to us by Moses. So now he's telling Joshua, now that we have crossed over and we've come over to the Jordan and the land is being given out, I remember. Do you remember what Moses told us? In verse 7, he says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses saw on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. That is the same message Joshua also got. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am, this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain on which, of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard it in that day, how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord had said. Now you, you, you realize that Joshua remembered this 45 years ago. He was told this 45 years ago. Now why didn't he give up on that promise? Habakkuk tells us why. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4, it says that the Lord answered me, that was Habakkuk, write down what I show you. Write it clearly on a sign so that the message will be easy to read. This message is about a special time in the future. This message is about the end, and it, will not, and it will come true. Just be patient and wait for it. The time will come. It will not be late. This message can not help those who refuse to listen to it, but those who are good will live because they believe it. So here we see that Joshua, you know, Caleb, when he heard what Moses said, that was a message that he held dearly for himself. And he said, you know, this will be my message. And therefore, because this is my message, it has spoken the end result. What is the end result? The land is yours. God is giving you the land that you have set your foot upon. And so he held on to that and he kept on saying it. I'm sure he must have written it somewhere because he's saying write the message so that whoever sees it can run with it. Otherwise, if it was not written, he will have forgotten. But he was even reminding Joshua, you remember what Moses said, which means somewhere, somehow, it was written down for him to remember. How many of us, if we receive a word from the Lord, write it down? Great. That helps you go back and read and find out, what did God tell me? So you can say, I remember when I was 20 years old, I was at this particular place. This is what the word of the Lord said. What is that? That was the end of what God has already promised you. And God says, it will come to pass. Hold on to it. If you believe it, it will come to pass. If you and I were like Joshua and Caleb, 40 years ago, I don't see how this is going to come into a reality. 45 years later, now they are 85 Joshua is saying, and Caleb is saying, I'm just as strong today as I was then. Why? Because that word has given me life. I'm so excited about this word today, just like it was then. And therefore, I've never lost my sight on that word. It is a reality to me. And that's why Caleb was able to stand and be able to do that. What else made him not to forget? Number one, we understand he must have written it down. Number two, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, that let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. In other words, Caleb was holding on to that confession that was given to him. We are being told, hold fast to that uh, confession. What do you mean by hold fast? It means that if you do not hold fast, you're going to let it go. So Caleb held on to that and said, no, this is a word of God for me. I don't care what I, what I see or what I face. We are going through the wilderness right now. And try and imagine everything that they went through. All the snakes in the wilderness. Remember that. He still held on to that. No, I have a promise to go into the promised land. 
You remember there were some tribes that came up and were rebellious against Moses and they were swallowed up by the earth. He was still that, no, no, no. I believe that I'm going to go into the promised land. You remember when uh, Moses' sister Miriam and Aaron, they rebelled against Moses. They saw what happened. They were held. He said that, no, no, no. I still have to go to the promised land. Why? God promised that to me. He was holding on to that profession. Why? Because if he let it go, he will never be able to see the reality of what God promised him. He held on to that. They went through so many challenges. He still held on to that promise that God promised me. I'm going to enter into that land and I'm going to possess it. So we need to do that. Number one, you need to write down what God has spoken to you. It could be personal when you're doing your own study time. It could be during a service. Or it could be someone who comes to you and give you a word from the Lord. You need to write that down. Number two, you need to hold it dearly. Don't let it go regardless of what you face. Regardless of what you face. Think of Achan. They've gone in. Jericho is down. They've been defeated. You could have like, man... Now I'm 80 years old because it took them five years from chapter 1 to chapter 12 to just drive out some of these people. Five years now at 80 years old, he said, like, no, what good is it? I'm already in this land. You know, thank God. I'm, at least I made it, right? No, no, no. God did not say you will make it into the land. God says you will possess the land. If you don't possess it, don't give up. Until you possess it, then now you can rejoice. But before you possess it, don't give up and say, at least I'm in the land. No, don't give up until you have what God has given to you. Now we need endurance. For the Bible says, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. In other words, you need to endure. Hold on. Don't give up. The promise is sure. It is alive and it is living to those who will believe it. And therefore, we have to, re we have to believe. We have to believe every word that is given to us by God. And that is what Jude tells us in verse 17. That you, dear friends, you must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ told you. You must remember. And the book of Deuteronomy was about the book of remembrance. Remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. In other words, your victory is actually determined by your memory. What do you remember? Do you remember what the Lord told you? Then it is settled. But if you don't remember what the Lord told you, then you are going to let it go. Do you know you can be robbed of your goods just because you don't remember? Just because you don't remember? I remember at one particular time, I was almost conned by somebody. And all these phone calls you get and someone tells you that, you know what, there's a problem with your account and I'm here to help you. And so they begin to give you information like, how did he get all this information? And you're almost believing him. But then inside, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Inside, something doesn't right. Occur. Why will he ask me for this if he has all this other information? What am I doing? I'm remembering. Remembering. What if I disregard what they're telling me and I say, oh my goodness, they must have all this. Oh, what do you want? Here, this is what you have. And you give it all. I'm going to lose what is mine. I gave it to them because I did not remember. So we have to remember what is told us. And therefore, in verses 11 and verses 12, he says, As yet, as I am strong this day, as on the day that Moses sent me. Now he's saying, even though I'm 85 years old today, I'm still as strong as I was when I was 40 years old. We need to have that kind of attitude. Because for some reason, we are lied to that when you reach 40, things change. That you begin, to, you begin to go to a, a downward slope. And people expect it. <laughs> they have 40, things are beginning to break down. So people begin to say that. No, Joshua is saying, I'm 85 years today, but I'm just as strong as I was when I was 40. What do you think is keeping him strong? The promise. Because the Bible says that the word of God is life. You get your life from the word of God. You do not get your life from the situations of the world. Do you ever know that you can take as much vitamins you want to take, exercise as much as you want to exercise, but that won't keep you healthy and strong? We do those things to help us get where we need to get, but if your spirit is not having any life in it, it doesn't matter how much vitamins you take and how much uh, nutrients you, you take in and how much exercise you take in, you're going to die. But the Bible tells us, you know what, godliness 
or uh, bodily exercise profits a little, not profits everything. But godliness is profitable unto all things. And so jo Caleb stayed with the word of God because he knows what uh, Solomon told us in Proverbs. My son, attend to my word. Incline your ears unto my saying. Let them not depart from your eyes, but keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. In other words, I am alive today just as if I was yesterday. Why? The word is keeping me alive. The very same spirit that is in that word is what is keeping me alive. And therefore, he was fighting the good fight of faith. Just like Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal promises. Run your race. And he says, nothing is going to knock me out until I see my promise. And so he stood, he endured, and he fought his fight of faith. Why? Because when he was looking at the promises of God, he was not just looking at the promises with a mindset of promises. He was looking at them with a mindset of destiny. This is my destiny. God told me that my destination is to possess the land. Therefore, anything that comes in between me and my destiny, I'm not going to be bothered by it. And that is what we need to have even today. Don't give up regardless of what comes your way. I have a destiny. What is that? That is what God tell me. And it shall be so even to those who believe. Whatever God tells you, hold on to it because that is your destiny. So I have a promise that that promise is my destiny and nothing is going to come between me and my destiny. And that is how Caleb was. And therefore he stood in there and he fought the good fight of faith. I like what he says in verses uh, 12. He says, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Do you see that his confession still stays the same? Because in the book of Numbers, when they came back, the other ten tribes says, we are not able, we look like grasshoppers. And Caleb and Joshua, they tore their clothes, and they say that, no, 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 the very same God who took us in, he is well able to give us the land. He is still saying the same thing. God is able to help me defeat the Anakim. So he's never changed his confession. Now, you've got to understand, he was never promised an allocation of land. He was promised a portion in the land. But now he's beginning to ask. In fact, he's the one who said himself, give me this land. Of all the tribes, None ask for the land but Caleb. Caleb was the only one who says, give me this land. Everybody else was allocated their land. You have this, you have that, you have that, you go there, you stay here. But Caleb said, no, 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 give me this one. This is where the giants are, and this is where I want to go because I know God is with me, and I'm going to have this piece of land. Now, why, why, why did he do that? Why did he say that? Well, because he understood something a lot of people don't understand. He understood that God says, if you ask, I will give you. Do you know in uh, Psalms chapter 2, verses 8, the Bible says, if you ask, I will give you the nations. Everyone on earth will be yours. You will rule over them with great power. You will scatter your enemies like broken pieces of pottery. So in other words, whatever you want, you ask. Even Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 3, it says, ask. When you call unto me, ask, and I will show you. Or ask, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things, even things that you do not know of yet. So many times you'll find believers who don't want to ask, because they say, I don't want to ask, because if I ask, I might ask too much. Or I might ask what I do not know. Well, do you know what the word of God says? Do you know if you have a right to that? Then you are okay to ask for it. Somebody one time said, you know what? I don't like to ask God for money. And I say, why? Because I don't want him to give me money because I don't want to be evil. <laughs> so I say, you know what? Money doesn't make you evil. Money just exposes whatever is there. <coughs> So already you are evil and you are afraid if money comes, it will expose you. Yeah, because money will expose that. That's why you'll find somebody who is just there and give them money. All of a sudden, you don't talk to me like that. I have money. Oh, that's what was hidden, hidden in your heart. Money is just exposing it. There are things that will expose who you are. Number one is power. And number two is money. Give somebody power and you'll know the true nature. Give somebody money and you'll know the true nature. And so we need to ask based on what the word of God says. 
God told him, I will give you the land. He walked into the land and said that, yeah, this is the land where the giants were. I want this land. Give it to me. God is still going to help me today to acquire this land. How many of us are able to ask God today? The land that God gave to them, he claimed it. It is mine. And he was given that land and actually he occupied it. Of all the tribes, only one person was able to ask for his land. And he was given. And therefore, God gave him that land. And when God gave him that land, he was able to occupy it. Now you've got to understand as you continue to go onwards, they continue to divide the land, but they were not able to follow God's instructions uh, clearly. In chapter 13, verses 13, Joshua told them this, Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Machetites, but the Geshurites and the Machetites dwell among the Israelites until this day. So they were told to drive them out, but they failed to drive them, so they stayed there. So God is reminding them, there is a lot of land that still needs to be occupied, but they are not occupying it. In chapter 15, verses 63, again, they are told this, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah did not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Which means the Jebusites are dwelling with the sons of Judah, though the sons of Judah were supposed to drive them out. So now the Jebusites are dwelling with them because they failed to take action on what they were supposed to take action of. In chapter 16 and verses 10, again they're told this, and they did not drive out the Canaanites who dwell in Gaza, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced laborers, which means everybody they did not drive out is still with them to this day. You wonder why there's some issues in the Middle East. Because they were given the responsibility to drive them out and they never did. So now they're still facing some issues over there. In chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, it says, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it happened when the children of Israel grew strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. So they were changing the whole strategy. God is saying, drive them out. Say, no, 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 we're not going to drive you. You're going to be our servants instead. They became a problem and a problem. Now, do you know what this problem was? In Numbers chapter 33, verses 55 through verses 56, they were already told what will happen if they do not drive the people out. And this is what it says. But if you do not drive out the native population, everyone you let stay there will become a hindrance or in your eyes and a splinter in your foot. They'll give you endless trouble right in your own backyard. And I'll start treating you the way I planned to treat them. So here God was saying that if you don't drive them out, they're going to be a trouble in your own backyard. How many people in our own backyard give us a problem because we fail to correct some stuff? Because I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to look like I'm offensive. So I better be cool. But keep on having the problem. Or take care of the problem. And I don't have any more problem. Another translation says it this way. It is easy to read translation. You must force these other people to leave the country. If you let them stay in your country, they'll bring many troubles to you. They will be like needle in your eyes and thorns in your side. They will bring many troubles to the country where you will be living. I showed you what I will do, and I will do that to you. So in other words, could there be troubles today we are going through because we have failed to drive out some things in our life? Are there things that God will have told you to get rid of, but you failed to get rid of them? So today you're going through those troubles because you never got rid of what God told you. Because it says if you don't drive them out, they're going to give you trouble. They're going to be like needles in your eye. It's painful to be poked by a needle in your finger. How much more in your eye? Exactly. Do you live your life going, ow, because you did not drive something out? A thorn in your side. Every time you try to do something, somebody shows up. Every time you do something, somebody shows up and it's like, man, when are these people ever going to leave me? So they're never going to leave you unless you drive them out. That's what God told the Israelites. If you don't do so, that is what's going to happen to you. We look at our lives today. Are there some things that God has told us 
that we have failed to do it just because we want to be nice. I know personally some people have issues with their family members because they're just family members and we have to be with family members, yet God is telling you something. But you don't want to leave your family members because it is your family members and so you end up being frustrated every single day. When God told you to leave them, he's not saying that discard them and leave them alone. He's just saying you need to separate from them. Because if you don't separate from them, then they're going to be a thorn in your side. You wonder why you keep on having trouble. Why do they keep on calling me? Do they think I'm a bank? Do they think I'm this? Do they think I'm that? As so long as you leave them in your backyard, I'm going to give you trouble. When are they going to leave me? They won't until you make the decision. There are some friends you're supposed to let go. But I can't because you don't know how far we've come with them. You don't know what they did for me. They've been there with, for me. They've done this so much for me that I just can't leave them. All right, they're going to be trouble to you. So there are some things that are self-inflicted trouble, problems. So God was warning them about that. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, could it be that the troubles I'm going through today as a result of something I did not want to get rid of? Why? Because of fear. Or because I don't want to be offensive, or I want to be nice. Could it be? Are you willing to take the this bold step and say, God, this is what you're telling me, and therefore I'm going to go with you. I'm going to trust you to be with me. It's never easy. Never leave, easy to leave the comfort of where you are. You know, there are sometimes uh, we go through pictures in the <laughs> in the house. And uh, there are some pictures I don't like, but they, the kids love it. <coughs> it's the picture of when I was coming over here. And I was crying, my eyes were red. So they always look at us and say, look, look your, your eyes were red. I say, yeah, I was crying. Why? Because I was leaving my family. That is where I was born. That's where I was raised. That's all I know. And I'm going to a place I've never been before. Never been before. I'm going to a place I don't know. In the plane, they could tell me I'm going to America and they take me to India. I'll think I'm in America. I won't know the difference. I've never been there. <laughs> so here I'm crying, going to a place I've never been. And here you have another family member saying, you think you're the one who knows God? Your plane is going to crash in the air. We're never going to see you anymore. <laughs> so I'm crying because I'm leaving the people whom I know, just trusting God that this is what God wants me to do. And so I'm walking with God, but you know what? I have the greatest peace today because I know I'm following God's plan. Following God's plan. And so we have to make that decision. Now in chapter 18, Joshua in verses 1 says, Now the whole congregation of Israel of, uh, assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. Now they changed their place of, uh, of congregation. You remember before they crossed Jordan, there was Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel. And in those mountains is where they'll gather and there'll be blessings and curses that are pronounced. But now that they've come over to this place, they don't have a meeting place. Now Shiloh becomes now the district place for business and religious gathering. They make it official that this is the place where we'll be gathering and this is where we'll be cutting out our affairs and this is what's going to take place between now on until Samuel is going to come in, when now Samuel becomes their prophet. So they said this over there, and when they said this over there, in verses 2 through verses 7, there is still some tribes who have not received their inheritance, even though they've been given the land, that this is your land. They've not inherited it yet. Why? They've not driven out the inhabitants. Why have they not in driven out the inhabitants? Verses 3 tells us of that. Verses 3 of chapter 18, it says, Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your father has given you? In other words, now they are being neglectful. Another translation says you are, you are slacking and you are faint. So Joshua is saying, How long will you keep on slacking and being faint to possess the land that God has given to you? In other words, you know what is yours, but actually you're not going for it. Why are you slacking? Why are you fainting to go and get what is yours? Because up to this point, God has always fought for us. Why don't you want to go and let God fight for you? What will make them be slack? 
Hebrews 6, 12 tells us, we don't, need, we don't want you to be lazy, but you want you to be like those because of their faith and patience will get God's promises. In other words, those who have received God's promises, they were not lazy. They were not slacking and they were not fainting. They were strong. They had faith in God. They knew the very same God who called them, the very same God who spoke to them, the very same God who was leading them is the one who's fighting for them. And therefore, they were not lazy. They were always strong and going to their place because they know God is with them. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 10 tells us this. If you are weak in the times of trouble, then that is real weakness. In other words, when you faint in the day of your adversity, you are really weak. In other words, you know very well you have the people you need to drive out, but you're slacking, then it means you're really weak. You don't even know who your God is. And therefore, we need to be strong and be able to go. What do you think caused them to be weak? I was asking God, see everything you've done for them. I'm now trying to think if I was there with them, because you know, it is easy to judge them because I'm reading from the Bible. They never had the Bible. They had to walk there. They didn't have anything to refer back to say, look what happened there and look what they saw it there themselves. But how come they're not going for it? So I just began to think of some scriptures like Luke 18.1. There's a reason why Jesus was saying that, you know what, men ought to pray always and never give up, which means they are not now praying. Their prayer level was going down. You know, sometimes when you get victory, that's when you give up and you pray anymore. See, I've gotten the job I was looking for. I have the family I was looking for. I have the vehicle I wanted. I have the house. What's the point of me praying now? What's the point? What's the point of me reading the Bible? But you see, when I'm looking for these things, I'm constantly pr praying, looking unto God, seeking God. I'm strong. I'm not giving up. If I don't get my house, if I don't get my vehicle, if I don't get my family together, oh, I'm not going to give up. But once I've gotten them, then I'm going to be weak. But Jesus says men ought to pray always and never give up. Which means when you find yourself giving up, you find yourself being weak and lazy, then something has happened to you. In other words, you're taking for granted what God has done for you, and therefore you're neglecting what is waiting for you ahead. Because that land still waits for you. And you need to be strong. Therefore, what do you need to do? I need to pray. Because Jesus says pray and never give up. When you pray, the Bible says in Jude 20, you're building yourself up in your innermost holy faith. You know, as long as you want to get along with somebody, you pray and you look for everything. And once you've gotten along with a person, you stop praying. And you find yourself irritated with other people. But do you know what? The Bible says when you pray in a known tongues, you're building yourself up in your innermost holy faith, keeping yourself in love. Which means when your love level is going down, check your prayer life. But I read the word. Yeah, you read the word, but you know what? It is actually prayer that activates it because it's, it is now relationship. I'm relating with the Father. And he'll speak to me and say, hey, check your love walk over here. Did you see how you are responding to that person over there? That comes through prayer. If you don't pray, you will neglo ignore all those. And so you need to get into, into, the, into prayer. What else? Worry. Worry will get you out of being strong and be weak and lazy. You start worrying today and you'll stop doing something. There's one time I wanted to be, I wanted to pray. And then all of a sudden a thought came to me about an individual. And all of a sudden it sent me into worries. And all of a sudden I lost the desire to go pray. He want to do it. Because now I'm concerned of this individual and what I'm thinking about it. But you know what? I had to get myself up and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm allowing worry to keep me from what is going to help me stand and endure. That's why the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayers and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So in other words, when worries come in, don't let it get hold of you. You get hold of it and say, okay, I'm taking you with me into the prayer room. Don't leave it over there because when you come out, you're going to find it. No, come with me. Because the Bible says, cast all your cares unto him. Come with me. I'm, I'm anxious right now. Now, Father, I cast all these cares and anxieties and worries unto you because I know you perfect those things which concern me. And you do care for me. And therefore, I cast all these cares unto you. Now I can have a good time. So when I leave, I have my answer. 
So worry will, pray, will play a role in you so that you do not go strong and possess what is yours. That is what happened to Job. He was so worried that his kids are going to make a mess. He kept on sacrificing, not because he really wanted to do it, just because he was worried so that his kids don't make a mess. How many people, how many of us are so worried about our kids that we do sometimes things we're not supposed to do? (laughs) Because I'm just so worried about my kid or my daughter or my son. I'm just so worried about them that if I don't do this, they might lose it. If I don't do this, they might miss it. I just have to do this. I just have to do this. It is worry that is driving you. Take that concern with you into prayer. Remember the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? All your sins and cares and burdens, what do you do? You take it to him in prayer, right? Yeah, so then you don't bother the other person. You don't bother them. (laughs) Because the more you bother them, the more they are going away from you. It's like, I'm just trying to be nice. Yeah, but they're not seeing it nice. They're seeing you being a bother. You're becoming a needle in their eye and a thorn onto their side. If you just leave me alone, I think it is uh, Richard Roberts who said that his dad kept on hammering in on, on walking with the Lord and praying and doing this and doing that. And he says he wasn't until one time his dad told him, son, I'm trying to. No, no, his dad asked him, what the hell are you trying to do? No. All right, there you go. You got the right version of it. <laughs> Is, yeah, he told his dad, Richard Roberts told Oral Roberts that, you know, what did he say? Get the hell out of, yeah. Yeah, get the hell out of my life. And his dad says, that is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> but then this is what he says. When my dad left me, then now I could hear God. Because the dad was there being a thorn on the side and a, a needle in the eye. Like, he's just bothering me. Leave me alone. Till he stepped away, what did he do? He took it to prayer. God say, he's yours. And therefore, I just pray for him. Lead him, guide him, show him the right way. Let there be people who are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit cross his path and minister to him. When you do so, God says, I know and I can perfect those things that concern you. I know about it and I'm glad that you're bringing it to me and I'm going to work on it because I'm waiting for you to ask me. Why? Because I say, if you ask of me of nations, I will give them to you. If you understand the influence of a parent, you will never criticize your child. Because God gave you that child. And the Bible said that children are a reward from the Lord. And and then the Bible said that God gave you the authority to be able to train them in the way they are supposed to go. So you have authority in showing them the direction. And if they don't hear you, all you simply do is go back to the one who gave you the authority and say, how am I going to deal with this? Because I don't understand it. And once you spend time with him, figuring out, he will tell you things that you never even think of doing and say, ah, I never knew that peanut butter and the jelly will bring my child close to me. Have you ever found some little things that, you know, brings you close to somebody whom you never thought was going to bring you close to? How did you find out that? When you went to him. But as long as you carry it, like they're doing this and they're doing it, God is saying, why are you joining the devil, accusing them? Because the devil is accusing them. You have taken the devil's side. Now you want me to take your side? I can't take your side because you're on the devil's side. You have to be on my side. And so worry caused them to be able to be strong. What else? Luke 21, 26 tells us this, that many men, their hearts will faint them. Why? Because they are looking at the things that are coming on the earth. What are you looking at? Whatever you're looking at will cause you to be weak, not to be able to possess what is yours. How many people today are giving up because of what they're seeing? I've heard believers tell me, oh, I'll never advise my kids to get children in this generation. What are you looking at? Are you looking still at the perfect law of liberty, the word of God that liberates and sets free, or are you looking at what's happening in the world? If you look at what's happening in the world, oh no, don't have any children. What are you looking at? It will cause you to be lazy and don't possess what God has given to you. And therefore, we have to understand, we have to be very focused with God, what God has given to us. What else will cause them to be slack? Temptation. The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Understand this, you're going to be tempted in every way. 
Because the testing of your faith produces patience, which means because now you know the Lord, you're going to be tempted. You don't know the Lord, we can't tempt you because we got you. And that's the difference between non-believers and believers. If you see an unbeliever in sin, don't say that, man, you are sinning. They don't understand. That's their nature. A believer who will sin, they are tempted to sin, but an unbeliever can never be tempted to sin. That is my nature. And therefore, whatever I do that is of sin, it is my nature. And therefore, if temptation comes, you need to stand up. The word of God says this. But you see, if you fall for temptation, it's going to weaken you. How many people fall into condemnation when they do something they're not supposed to do? Believers. They fail to go to church. They fail to read the Bible. They fail to pray. Why? They're feeling bad. You know what? I don't think God still loves me anymore. Why? Because you fell for a temptation. No, the Bible says when you fall, you rise up. You don't stay there. Because who is going to set you free? God himself. So you don't run away from God because of sin. You run to God because of sin. He is the only one who can set you free. And therefore, when you fall for a temptation, get up and go to the Father and say, you know what? I missed it. And I need help. He's going to strengthen you because he's going to make a way of escape through that temptation. And so this is what one of the things that was actually hindering them from going forth. Now, this all are happening when the land they ought to possess should be possessed, but they're not possessing it. So chapter 19, they keep on dividing the land, but then verse, verses 49 of chapter 19 says this. When they had made an end of the dividing the land as an inheritance, according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he had asked for. Timnath Sarah in the mountains of Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt in it. Verses 51, these were the inheritance which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided as an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of tabernacle of meeting. So they made an end of dividing the country. Something very interesting we are seeing over here. Joshua also asked for a piece of land. Just like Caleb also asked for a piece of land. The rest of the tribe never asked for a piece of land. The interesting thing is Joshua is actually portray, portray, uh, portraying true leadership. The leader is eats last. He did not eat first. Everybody has been given their piece of land. Now he says, okay, could I get mine? So many times today you'll see some leaders, they eat first. I get my share first and then the rest. No, no, no. A true leader will let the people eat first. A true leader will let the people feed first. A true leader will lead the people first before they take anything else. Because their main motive is to empower the people so that they can succeed and prosper. Then now they'll come after them. They will not hold everything and then say, I'm so busy for you. I don't have time for that. When I become so busy for you, it means I'm eating and you're not. Because my position is to empower you. My position is to help you. Now, if you need the help and you can't find me, it means I'm eating too much and you're starving. Because the reason why I'm in this office is to help you, not to be isolated from you. And so Joshua waited until everybody has gotten their land. And I said, now I can have mine. Now here, was the, after they had finished this, now they had to be able to go to the other cities and ask them to allocate pieces of land for cities of refuge. And in chapter 20, actually they talk about the cities of refuge in chapter 20. And that was pretty much for if someone killed somebody, if it was intentional, it was required with your life. If it was unintentional, then you will stay in this city of refuge until the high priest died. And so what will happen is when you've killed somebody, whether intentional or unintentional, you had to run to these cities. So every tribe had their own cities. It was like a court. When you kill somebody, you run to the courts of law. And since you've run to the courts of law, nobody can be able to touch you until the elders come and then they judge you. And when they find you guilty, then you have to die because you killed somebody intentionally. If it was unintentional, then now they'll find that you're, you did not kill somebody intentionally. So now they're going to say, you are going to stay in this city, and you're going to stay until the high priest dies, then you're free to go. But if the high priest is still alive, you stay in that city 
That was your punishment. Why? So that, when you, so that nobody kills you out there. Because there's somebody there who wants to revenge and kill you back. So chapter 20, that is what they did. Isn't it great that the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, is our refuge? The Bible says that, you know what? God is our refuge and our fortress. A very present help in time of need. So anytime that there is an issue, let you run to him. That's why the Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe and they are secure. And therefore now they have that with them. In chapter 21, the cities are defined for, with the Levites. And then we come to chapter 22. And in chapter 22, something is very interesting now because the tribes that were brought with Israelites across the other side of Jordan, they came to help them in fighting. But now the time is done. All the land has already been allocated, but now they have to fight the people. So, in verses, uh, so the, the soldiers have to go back. Verses 5, Joshua begins to give them instructions. And he tells them this in verses 5. But take careful heed, in, verse, in chapter 22, take careful heed to do the commandments and the laws which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with the whole of your heart and with all of your soul. What simply this means is this. Even though they were soldiers, their responsibility was to help these Israelites fight, but they had a call of God which was far much higher than their own military duty. We need to understand that in life, our spiritual responsibility supersedes every other responsibility. It supersedes your marriage. It supersedes your job. It supersedes your call, your spiritual responsibility. That is your own fellowship with God. That is number one in your life. And then other things come into place. So now that there were soldiers, Joshua is telling them that he gave them six strong commands. Number one, say, be careful to do the commandments and the laws which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded them. So in other words, he was reminding them, remember the word of the Lord. You do that. I know you are a soldier, but never neglect the word of God. How many people today will uh, uh, actually work at the expense of the word of God? I've been so busy, never had time to study the word of God. Joshua was reminding them, that, I know you are soldiers, but remember the commandment of the Lord. Don't walk away from that. The second one, he was telling them that, you need to love the Lord your God to walk in all his ways. So in other words, love the Lord your God. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commands. If you love me, you keep my commands. In other words, love is to be expressed and never to be contained. You can't tell, you love, you can't tell me you love the Lord, but you don't see the expression of it. <laughs> I love the Lord, but you don't see it. Then you're told to walk in all his ways. In other words, Take it serious, the call of God. Walk worthy of your vocation. Walk worthy of your call. Then the next one is telling them that, you know what? Keep his commandments. In other words, never neglect the word of the Lord. And then cleave to him. If you abide in him and his word abides in you, then you will be able to do the things he has called you to do. And then the last one was to serve him. In serving him, you have to sanctify yourself. You're told that every house has got different kinds of vessels. Vessel of honor and vessel of dishonor. But if you purge yourself from dishonor, you'll be a vessel of honor. And therefore, Joshua spoke to them and gave them that command while they're going back. Now, that brings us to chapter 23. In chapter 23, Joshua begins to speak to them about his farewell address, just like Moses was doing in the book of Numbers. And in verses 4 through verses 10, Joshua tells them this. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God has promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. And lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. 
For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he, has, he who fights for you, he has promised. Now here Joshua is telling them that, you know what? So far right now, God has been fighting for us. But I want you to understand this. If you will sanctify yourself and set yourself apart, one of you will actually fight a thousand. Which means now God is increasing his power through the people. Which means one person is equivalent to driving out a thousand people. What if all of them come together? How many people are they going to drive? Which means you don't need soldiers. You just need to sanctify yourself. Have the right heart. You both agree together. And when you begin to walk, guess what? God is fighting for you. That's why the Bible says when two people come to an agreement, taking anything on earth, it shall be done unto them by my Father who is in heaven. So Joshua was telling them that you need to understand this. If you do not drive them out, you're going to have problems. And therefore now they have a covenant and they need to sanctify themselves and be able to arrange themselves so that they can be able to do what God has called them. In chapter 24, Joshua now actually tells them this last words before actually he dies. This is his farewell speech. He called everybody together again and began to speak to them. In verses 14, he tells them, Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. I find this interesting because they've been walking with the Lord. They've been told never to have any other gods, but Joshua is telling them this here, verses 14. Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity. You see, Right now, they need to be sincere with the Lord. And how many believers also need to be sincere? I find it now, especially being a pastor, I'll say almost a quarter of the people are not sincere. Three quarters are sincere. Someone will look you right into the face and say, Pastor, I love this place. I'll be right back next time. And you don't see them. And I'm like, why are you lying to me? Be sincere. <laughs> I'm not going to come back. I don't like the place. It won't offend me. Because this place is not for everybody. It is for specific people. And therefore, you need to find your own pastor and go submit to your own pastor. Don't try to make me feel good that you're going to come back over here. No. There's no sincerity. Someone will look at you and say, Pastor, I'm going to do that. And then they don't do it. If you ask them, where are you? Oh, you know what? I was busy with this and I was busy with that and I was busy. Where is the sincerity of your heart? Are you doing it to me or are you doing it unto the Lord? So Joshua was reminding them the same thing. Serve the Lord with a sincere heart. In other words, you're not serving man. You are serving God. And whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. Don't try to make anybody happy. Don't try to please any man. See, I don't come here to please any man. If you don't like my preaching, oh, well, that's good. I thank God because he's the one who gave it to me. I'm not going to cry over it. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm not going to please you. I'm not going to come and say, okay, oh, Becky, you liked the preaching last Sunday? I'm going to make sure I preached again this Sunday, just like that Sunday, so that you can be happy. No, I won't do that. <coughs> it is the same thing. Whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. Don't try to please any man. So Joshua's reminding them, have a sincere of heart. When you're serving the Lord. And then he goes on to tell them this. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So here Joshua was not giving them an option. Joshua was telling them, you know what? Your forefathers served the gods over the other side before we crossed Jordan. And now the Amorites who are living in this land are also having the gods whom they are serving. But you choose today whether you want to serve the gods of your forefathers or you want to serve the gods of the Amorites. But as far as you and I know, I'm serving the living God. So we likewise should be able to make up our minds in serving the Lord. Because if we don't make our minds in serving the Lord, we will find ourselves being defeated. There are things we don't want to get rid of. 
because we are attached to them. And this is probably what happened with them. Oh, this was my grandfather's whatever, and it was an idol. This was my grandmother's whatever, it is an idol. This was my mom's whatever, it is an idol. And the Bible said that, no, 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 you choose whether you're going to serve that idol or you're going to serve the Lord, your God. I'm not trying to say that if your parents or your grandparents gave you something, it's an idol. I'm not saying that. But maybe they were worshiping another God. And uh, this one is more prominent. In the United States, I'm now beginning to see this as well. In back at home, I see it quite often whereby somebody will be a believer. They'll go to church. They'll pray. But then tomorrow, they'll go consult another spirit to protect them at their workplace. So you'll find them with some things, some chalices they tie on their uh, bracelets, they tie on their hands. Well, that is helping me at my workplace. Or some necklace they have, or some things they tie on their waist, because this is protecting me from what's taking place. In the United States, I'm beginning to see that as well. Yeah, beginning to see that. Which means, which God are you serving? You have to serve. Do you want to serve the gods of this land? Or do you want to serve the living God? So Joshua was telling us, for me, I'm going to serve my God. Now, Joshua is not the only one who was having a problem with them. You remember even Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, when the prophets of Baal were there and the people were serving, he said, choose this day whom you're going to serve, whether it's the Baal or it's going to be the God Almighty. Elijah told them that. Paul also tells us that in, first, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1. If you have been raised up with Christ, Set your mind on the things that are above. In other words, don't be back and forth on earth and the things that are above. Set your mind once and forever so that you can be able to live with that. And therefore, when we know that, it helps us. In verses 16 and 18, the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, it is he who brought us out of our, uh, who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell in the land. Verses 19, I like this, Joshua, Joshua called them up and says, But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. In other words, God, Joshua was telling them, You know what? Your self-righteousness will not help you inherit the land. You are having idols. You are holding on to them, but you're still saying you're going to serve the Lord. Don't fool yourself. God is not going to be happy with you when you're doing that because he's a jealous God. And so many times you'll find sometimes believers, they are stuck with something that is contrary to the Bible, and they're also still speaking to the Bible, and then you wonder why they're not getting results. It's because God is a jealous God. You cannot serve the other God and then also serve the Almighty God and expect to get the results of God. Choose whom you're going to serve. If it is God, stay with God. If it is the other God, stay with the other God. But don't try to mix it both because what? God is a jealous God. And therefore, we have to know that Joshua told them that. Actually, Joshua told them three times. Three times they said, no, no, no. Far be it from us. We can never serve the other gods. And Joshua told them that you are serving the other gods constantly. He kept on telling them that and telling them that and telling them that. And then finally, Joshua began to tell them from verses 22 through verses 28. I'm actually going to set a monument over here. And they're going to be stones. And these stones today are going to have ears to what I'm telling you and what you've heard. Because whatever you do, these stones will speak back to you. Which means when you see these stones, you'll remember that you personally say you're going to serve the Lord. But if you don't, these stones will speak to you and remind you. You remember when you say you're going to serve the Lord alone? Now you're serving other idols? Now you are in trouble. You and I don't need to have stones to speak to us. We have the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And once we do that, it's supposed to help us. Now at the end of it, Joshua dies in chapter 29, in verses 29. And then Eliezer the priest also dies in Verses uh, 30, uh, 32 and 33 and, the uh, that, th 33, and they buried them. And now the book of Joshua is done. The Israelites are now on their own to follow the Lord their God. Now something happens because there are some leaders who are with Joshua. They outlived Joshua. Joshua died at the age of 110. Now there are these leaders who have now come up 
and now are continuing. The Bible says that they continue to serve the Lord even after Joshua had passed. But the problem is they never trained the next generation. And now that's where the Bible says there arose another generation after those who have died who did not know the Lord. My question is, these 45 years that you've been working with Joshua, do you want to tell me nobody took the responsibility to train the next generation? You see how it is important today not to leave our children at home, not to read our Bibles in hidden places where our children do not see us. Children like to ask questions. Open your Bible. They'll come and say, what are you reading? If you read it in secret, no, I read it before I go to bed after putting my kids in bed. Your kid will, will never know you read a Bible. That's another generation that will never know the Lord. When your grandkids come to spend time with you, let them see you read the Bible. Why? You are influencing them. If you never know that, that, that's another generation that will never know the Bible. Let them come and show them why you are reading that Bible. Do something with them. Whether it is only five minutes, it will be able to leave an imprint on them. Otherwise, there will be another generation. I don't want to be a generation that is known that I walked with the Lord, yet my children never knew the Lord. And like I mentioned last week, if you did great in your generation, and those people who follow you do not know the Lord, you are a failure. Because your success is determined by those who are following you, not what you're doing. I'm doing what I'm doing today because of my people who succeeded me. They made a good mark on me. That's why this generation, I'm doing what I'm doing. But in the next generation, if we don't train them, guess what? We are failures. And we have to work in collaboration. Parents and the church have to work together because we are believing the same thing. And God is going to help us. Amen? Next week, we begin to see the three stages that took place in the book of Judges. The first stage was the stage of apostasy, which means they began to walk away from the Lord. They never really came close to the Lord at all. Then the next stage was actually captivity. They were captured by the very same people. They never drove out of the land. And then the third one was actually now they were delivered. God brought in a leader to be able to help them through. We're going to go through all those stages and you'll see how it applies into your life. When you don't follow the Lord, you actually go into apostasy. And when you go into apostasy, then you end up being held captive by something or somebody. And then now you need a deliverance. So they went through that cycle until Samuel came in. That's what we'll be able to begin to look at next week. Amen. Father, we honor you this evening. We are so grateful for you instructing us and teaching us in your ways. Father, you're so merciful, yet so loving and kind. You are teaching and instructing us through the Israelites what your heart is for us today. And Lord, as we hear your word, I pray that, Lord, your word will be a light unto us. It will start us up, Lord, where we want to walk and live in righteousness, where we want to please you in all things that we do. And now, for the Lord, I make a statement right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that everybody who's applying their lives to your word, for the Lord, everything will begin to straighten out. Their health will straighten out. Their finances will straighten out. Their families will straighten out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their businesses and their jobs will straighten out. Why? Because, Lord, we have chosen to receive your word. And your word being a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, it will enlighten us in every area of our lives. And I decree right now that our families are living in unity, in love, and in health in the name of Jesus Christ. Our businesses and our jobs are prospering in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I decree that everything we set our hands upon becomes a blessing. And Father, we give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so very much for giving me an opportunity to speak to you. Have a wonderful rest of your week and looking forward to seeing you on a Sunday as you're going to have a good Mother's Day service. Amen. Thank you.